Well, it's such a privilege to be together in this seminar. I, I perceive that God is going to work in some powerful ways here. Eyes unable to see, eyes blind, or seen dimly. Uh, what is going to take place here? Can eyes open? Can eyes open to the power of God? Can eyes open to the kingdom and the rule of God? To incarnation? To God becoming flesh in us, dwelling among people? God using us as instruments of transformation. An opening of eyes, theologically or biblically. An opening of eyes culturally to see what is existing out there. An opening of eyes historically to see what has happened in the past and how that comes into the present. An opening of eyes strategically, how theology comes into practice. An opening of eyes spiritually, spiritual formation, so that we are then being transformed into his image, being changed. In this presentation, I'm going to use what I call the missional helix. We have been talking about an opening of eyes, an opening of eyes theologically, an opening of eyes culturally, an opening of eyes historically, an opening of eyes strategically, an opening of eyes spiritually. I'm going to begin kind of the paradigm out of which I'll form the, the workshop. We will be talking about the missional helix. The missional helix is a growth model that we begin at a certain level and we gravitate to higher and higher levels. We can see this in the full diagram. Next slide. The diagram, and let me kind of work through each part of the missional helix. I'd like to begin with cultural analysis. In cultural analysis, we will determine types of people within a cultural context. We will understand the construction of their realities, how they socially relate to one another how to explain the Christian message in such a way that it intersects with them. So in the first part, we will do a couple sessions on cultural analysis. Secondly, well, let, let me uh, talk about cultural analysis just a little bit in terms of Old Testament Baalism, uh, in terms of a biblical understanding, or the reigns of Ahaz, who followed the gods, followed by Hezekiah, who followed Jehovah God, followed by Manasseh, who went back to the pagan gods. So that would be a, a cultural, historical analysis. Secondly, we will reflect theologically. In fact, we will spend more time theologically than any other way because we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It sorts out our reality, and it defines who we are. So we thus view culture through the eyes of God. Uh, I, I picked one passage to read for the importance of this, and this is Isaiah chapter 8, in which Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Israel. I will put my trust in him. Isaiah is saying that sometimes it appears that God's not around. Things are broken. But then, two verses later, 
Isaiah 8, 19, he said, when men will tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their Lord? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living to the law and the testimony? And so we can see the interaction in the biblical text between the animistic and the way of the Lord. Thirdly, we will reflect historically uh, some paradoxes. Many of us are formed by modernity. And we think of almighty self-sufficiency. And we carry that to animistic people. And so we have sometimes within us a non-Christian philosophy that is rooted deep that down that is mixed with our Christian philosophy. So we'll track that historically for, for one hour. So we're not going to one little period of these ten periods. And then thirdly, we will talk about strategy formation. Strategy formation helps shape us and develop our methodologies. What is truth encounter? What is power encounter? And probably above all, what is cultural encounter as we deal with death, burial, um, and, uh, and all the issues that come in life. But surrounding the missional helix is spiritual formation. How do we walk in with God in be, and, and be transformed into his nature? I think about Ephesians 4.13, that there are various gifts for equipping God's people for works of ministry so we're not cast here and there by every wind of doctrine, but we grow up into him who is the head, and that is Christ. I think that phrase, equipping God's people for works of ministry, is so important. And you'll hear me use Ephesians and Colossians as well as the Gospels and the book of Acts as we talk about uh, animistic contexts. You'll begin to read scripture differently, I think, as we go into theological reflection. You know, on top of, in terms of the missional helix, here's how I prioritize it. Uh, I, I'm going to have two sessions on cultural analysis, and I'm going to begin with cultural analysis rather than theological reflection. And the reason why is we will do theological reflection in terms of cultural analysis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, usually I like to begin with theology and then move to culture, but in this context, I'm going to begin with cultural analysis because it is important for us to define who we are. And then in theological reflection, I mean, I'm going to work through God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and angels. So I'm going to, I'm going to work through, I, I, I'm going to, you're going to kind of get a feel for the Bible in terms of God and gods in the Old Testament and Christ and demons and the church of the, and the principalities and powers. So you can see how people of God's orientation, Christians led by the Holy Spirit, tend to perceive certain things. So I'm going to do four of our 10 class periods on theological reflection. Now, we'll go into practice. Then I'll do one on historical pers perspective, and I have one agenda there, and that's the disparity between missionaries from a Western culture and those who live in that culture and the big cultural gaps. So I'm already giving you my agenda for that session. But, and it's very, very important. And, and the changes of the world and how to read those are very, very important. I think we need to be Christians who are anthropologists, Christians who, with discerning eyes and ears, read the culture. And then 
we will do strategy, uh, strategy development. And in that strategy development, we'll, we'll talk about um, a truth encounter and power encounter and then cultural encounters. When we talk about cultural encounters, we have to talk about those times where animism comes up. And you, you probably know those times, birth, death, illness, there are rituals during those times. What happens during those times? A theme in this seminar is going to be syncretism. Our syncretism, there is no one in this audience that is not syncretistic. We all merge our culture so that, you know, those who come out of a scientific heritage tend to be pretty much modernity. Throughout this seminar, we will, we will do a lot in terms of uh, spiritual formation because it's embedded in everything. But then we'll do that last class on spiritual formation, which is this outside part of the missional helix. So as, as, our, as our diagram shows, uh, this is kind of a pathway, uh, an intentional pathway that we will follow during this time. So let's, let's go ahead and I'm going to begin to reflect on cultural analysis. I would call cultural analysis defining in this case, an animistic worldview. I mean, in another culture, I might call it a secular worldview. Or if I'm working with uh, this developing North American culture and maybe Indian Asian culture, I might call it a pantheistic worldview. Uh, or I might even call it defining a Christian worldview that is distinctive. So at this point, we are... Uh, talking about developing um, or, or defining an animistic worldview. I'd like to give you three assumptions of an animistic worldview. Three assumptions of an animistic worldview. So this is assumption number one, that the seen world is related to the unseen world. Uh, humans are thought to be controlled by spiritual powers. We can handle this stuff ourselves. Uh, our world is guided by ancestors and ghosts, by gods and spirits. Uh, people are manipulating us and others by witchcraft or sorcery. There is, there is the curse or the evil eye. So they seek to appease these powers through sacrifices and through libations, through rituals, through charms and amulets. Now, the paradox is that westernized Christians shaped by secular education are typically unable to perceive the animistic worldview. Uh, it comes out of enlightenment, which amplifies the process of emphasizing the superiority of humans uh, and human reasoning and negating the influence of spiritual powers. So many times we come into a two-tiered uh, two way of looking at reality. Uh, first of all, on the upper level or the lower level is the natural realm. Uh, we live as people, that we have the church, science, we perceive everything by sight and experience. People act by knowledge. But I think we also then believe in a spiritual realm in which there's angels and demons. It's perceived by miracles and visions. It's perceived by faith. But there's a segmentation between the spiritual and the natural and sometimes we segment that in our actions. We segment that in our thinking. Uh, Paul Hebert talked about the excluded middle. And 
uh, next slide. The excluded middle uh, is, while we believe in the supernatural and we believe in the natural, we look at that this worldly activities is almost non-existent. So we live as secular people while believing in God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, while believing in science, but then we negate all of this stuff that is happening in the world. And uh, let me give the second assumption that power is sought to control life. Now, there are many kinds of powers. There's the power of the ancestor to control the lineage. There's the power of the evil eye to kill a newborn or to ruin a harvest, many times induced because of jealousy. The power of the planets to affect earthly destiny. The power of the demonic to possess a spiritist. The power of magic to control human events or power or the, the, the magic that controls impersonal spiritual powers. Now, sometimes power is used, and I think I have three different ways in this presentation. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, there is malevolent power. It's malicious. It's used by the witch that no one knows, and diviners search out witches, and cultures tend to want to kill the witches. Or there is, um, uh, there is not just malevolent, but there's benevolent power in animism. So we go to a diviner, and this diviner helps us get well. And so he is the public person, the nice person, in animistic culture. So there's the malicious, malevolent, but there's the benevolent person who's kind of like a doctor uh, to people. And then I think that sometimes we don't know who they are. They are ambivalent. So maybe this diviner is also behind the scenes, someone who is malevolent. He might also be uh, a witch. Uh, uh, to use spiritual power in different ways. There are different terminologies used to define animism. And let's, uh, first of all, uh, spirit, let me just say spiritual beings are propitiated, they're coerced, or they are placated. Those are kinds of uh, uh, words that are used. Uh, magic rituals is developed because of its power to influence in spiritual, impersonal spiritual forces and spiritual beings. And let me just let's just go on beyond that. Let's let's go to Christianity a little bit, as it is related to this. Here are some questions that animists uh, typically ask: Who has caused? Um, I'm going to get my PowerPoint out here so I can make sure I know what's coming up next. I'm sorry for being a little disorganized here. Um, here are some questions that an animist will typically ask. Who caused this affliction to come up on us? Who caused this illness to come up on me? Or number two, the why. Why has this happened to our family at this time? So I go to a diviner to find out the why. Or what power is troubling us? What has caused this? Uh, is it an ancestor? Is it a spirit? Is it witchcraft? It is, is it the evil eye? Is it the stars? A final question is, who can help us to discover the cause and the source of this, e uh, this evil? And so there's usually a diviner who helps in doing this. 
So let's then go to some ways, some Christian reflection at this point. Uh, animism is contrasted to the way of God in Jesus Christ in some very, very specific ways. Christians in an animistic heritage must not view God's power as something to be manipulated or controlled. Now, we can see this in, in certain kind of religious groups in which God is being ordered to operate. Father, cast it out, cast it out. Or the, and almost always the human fingers are involved because there's a big difference between human fingers and trust in God. Because no human personality can do this type of ministry. It is God that works through us. Christians are called into a loving covenant relationship with Creator God. And out of that loving personal relationship, God works into, in us to discern, to see, to act. I guess I'd like to say God's power is not only greater than Satan's power, but it is of a different quality. It is based in love. God is our Father. We are His children. We approach Him out of love, but the character of Satan who has been cast down is malicious. And that power is, um, is manipulative. Uh, I guess I will read at this point um, Ephesians chapter 2. I think Ephesians 2 says uh, a lot uh, about this. Listen to these words. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived, lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thought, like the rest we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love in us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised you up with Christ and seated you with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Talking about a fundamental passage. You were contorted. You were messed up. Uh, and you can imagine all the stuff that happens that are part of whatever culture you're in. And it might not just be animism. It might be secularism that we trust by our own might and power. Or it might be pantheism in which we try to merge with the oneness of the world because somehow the power is within us and we're going to access that oneness of the world that comes out of new age and uh, you know it's the developing world view uh, here in the United States and in much of the world um, and so this passage is, ha has this word but but because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ do you hear how personal that is? God, who has made us alive, works in Christ. And so I think we can always begin to think about a diagram that's like this, that here is God, and here's Christ, and here's the Holy Spirit. And then... The church lives in God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The church worships God who is the creator. We 
walk with Jesus in His way and pray to God in Jesus who intercedes before the throne seat of God. And we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's the theme of the Bible. I mean, in the Old Testament, it's so much about God. And then pretty soon we find how God works in Jesus. I mean, there's indications of Jesus all the way along from creation on. And then in Acts, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And so there's, there's a development in the Bible that reveals that. But the paradox is sometimes the church kind of lives here kind of off in the borderline syncretistically rather than in God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And syncretism is basically the relegating of a theology of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit and other kinds of things that are related to God to the side and we live in a Christian way plus the other things that we add. So these are some, uh, some perspectives. So I'd like to go to a third assumption. And that assumption is controlling powers are determined by divination because humans are tremendously inquisitive. Uh, but it's more than that. I'm sick. Why am I sick? Uh, my daughter's not doing well in school. Why is she not doing well at school? Let me give an example of Marta, a Bolivian Christian living in La Paz who was frightened. She was feeling sick and she was steadily losing weight. Uh, soon after uh, that, doctors indicated that nothing was wrong. And uh, a friend jokingly said to her, somebody must have cast a spell on you. And Marta mentioned this to her mother, and her mother was a Sunday school teacher in a major church. And um, she was a faithful member, but her mother began to take what Marta said very personally, and she approached a curandero, a shaman who divines the source of problems, you know curandero, and, and this curandero cast cocoa leaves. How did they land? And he analyzed, analyzed these cocoa leaves. And he said that her illness was based upon the jealousy of her husband's former girlfriend. And this girlfriend had cast a spell on her. And so the curandero prescribed a live guinea pig that was then rubbed over Marta's body and was then taken to the city of the girlfriend and was killed, which would then turn this curse back on the girlfriend. And so you can see here the... The, the role of divination. Divination has, is a twofold process because animists seek to dis discern the source of the illness or the source of the problem. In this case, the source of the problem was done by the ritual of casting and the reading of cocoa coca leaves. And the second part, not just to discover the source, but to now, how do we respond? What is the human response? And the human response was the ritual of taking a guinea pig, rubbing it over Mar Marta's body to absorb what was thought to be the, the, the spell and then killing it close to where the girlfriend lived. And of course, Christianity stands out against those kinds of rituals. But let me stop just a second. If we think that those kinds of rituals 
are not practiced and they're simply superstition, then I'll tell you what, we're not then even beginning to cope with the issues of our culture. I'd like to give one very brief, um, uh, let me get back to another sheet here. Um, let me give one final assumption of this. Assumption number four, sources of evil are anxiously sought. Um, I, I think this is the roots of fear. It, I mean, when there's illness, we ask why. And we, we will have to deal a lot in this theology of why does God do what he does? Uh, what is Satan in this world? What is the demonic in this world? Uh, so an animist thus is never completely confident that all the powers are lined up on their side. The most powerful verse to an animist, and I've heard it so many times among the Kipsigis of Kenya, is perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. So we begin to speak about a certain way of living a certain way of living in the heavenlies far above the principalities and powers. So we're shaped by, by, by this certain way of walking with God. Now what I'm going to do in this next session is I'm going to give you a very concise definition of animism. And then uh, we will begin to talk about how these practices are worked out. So this session and the next session on uh, cultural analysis. So I think this is perhaps a good introduction despite kind of our logistical struggles.